With a new government in place, with violence on the streets, uh, it sounds it sounds like the um, like the prelude to a song in Fiddler on the Roof. But uh, there is a complex and evolving nature of the center of politics where where is the center in contemporary british politics uh, th this is a time of significant flux where traditional boundaries between the left and the right and the right and the far right and so on are blurred leaving many people feeling political politically homeless and disillusioned i certainly do and how has the center shifted what is the impact of Brexit, which eight years ago, I, I think still is the most resonant event in the last 20 years and uh, is, is still impactful and is one of the things that has disenfranchised so many, leaving people feeling hopeless, feeling unheard. Historically, the political centre has always been a space of moderation where politics, policies, ideologies are balanced between the extremes of right and left. And the centre has often been associated with pragmatism, a commitment to market economics tempered by a concern for social justice and a belief in gradual reform. In recent years, however, the middle ground has become increasingly contested and increasingly polarized it's no longer that place of pragmatism and um, safety it's become a place where 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 issues are debated and proposals can often seem extreme dr rene uh Hodekamp and alex phillips have suggested in a recent talk TV discussion uh, that the political center has shifted leftwards. They argue that many positions once considered centrist, such as a support for public services and welfare, are now viewed as left wing. And I don't think they're saying this simply because Kerr Starmer has won an election. I think they are suggesting that this has already happened. This has happened at the end of the conservative government. Um, they're, they're, they're talking about riots by local Muslim population. Uh, and um, they're responding to the riots in Sunderland, spiralling into a night of criminal thuggery as a police station was set on fire and objects were hurled at officers and two rival riots were facing each other. And those who hold traditional conservative views are sometimes now labelled as far right, they say. And this redefinition of the center raises critical questions about how we can categorize political ideologies and the language used to describe them. They say the right, um, the right is now ignored and the rioters give the left a right to ignore us uh, and the destruction of poverty, uh, the, the, the destruction of property when people are so poor seems irrational. Blame it on the far right. Invent a new term, they say. Um, if the rest of the population is far right, the center is now far left. And they talk about, you know, they, they, they talk about trying to redefine who are we now? 68 million in our country and we're seeing a democratic change. Um, where the stupid people, the far-right people, uh, who didn't know what they were voting for when they did Brexit. This is the language they say on this uh, show. This is the language which is being used to pillory the far-right. Or indeed, the right. Uh, this is a... This is something that I think was brought in heavily by the proposal of Brexit, by the impact of Brexit, by the Brexit vote. Brexit has been this pivotal factor in reshaping British politics. 
It has not only redefined party allegiances, but it's exposed deep divides in the electorate. The Brexit vote characterised by concerns over sovereignty, immigration, economic inequality, has transcended traditional party uh, divisions. People across the political spectrum feel disenfranchised and are seeking their own political identity. It's a time of flux. Um, and is the right really far right? And has, has it become far right simply by standing still? Or is something... Is, is, is there something meaningful in the rise of xenophobia, the Brexit concerns about open borders, the loss of authority, uh, the loss of national integrity, concerns about wage compression, and so on? For many, Brexit was a response to a, this perceived erosion of national identity and control. The fear of uncontrolled immigration, the pressure it was believed to exert on public services and wages central themes and plastered across the bus, the destruction of the NHS. As noted by political scientist Matthew Goodwin, the Brexit vote was a revolt against a political class that had become too disconnected from the concerns of ordinary voters. And this disconnect has contributed to the feeling of abandonment, particularly among those who feel their voices were ignored by the mainstream political narrative that has got on with diluting the Brexit that they thought they were voting for. But even those who did not vote for Brexit, like me, we also feel that the political continents have shifted beneath our feet and we are no longer uh, politically aligned with the parties that maybe we, we once... Um, voted for. The parties have shifted. We seem to have stayed still. And this is an experience that people have got across the political spectrum. It's not that... I, I don't believe I've moved to the left. I don't believe my friends have moved to the right. The parties have shifted. And what the parties are doing has shifted. And to try and uh, to try and hook up with their base, they're talking about conservative values or labour values. These things don't exist. Um, people, people on the left talk about the working class. What is the working class? I'm not. I'm never very sure about that concept. If you've got a mortgage, you're not working class, surely. Um, and, you know, so many of us, our parents, our grandparents, genuinely were working class. The working class is an ideology. It's a concept. It's not a reality. The middle class, this idea of aspiration... That, I think, probably is a reality. But most of us are in it. If we are aspirational, whether, whether that aspiration is driven by education or it's driven by um, the acquisition of money, it is about change. And so the working class which wants change is no longer working class. If the right has become more extreme which it has, um, then the rhetoric surrounding Brexit, the rise of populism, has amplified the nationalist, the protectionist sentiments. And this might reflect that right-wing move, this hardening stance on immigration, this scepticism towards international institutions. But we have to distinguish between legitimate concerns and xenophobia. And many Brexit supporters have vo uh, voiced concerns about open borders and the erosion of national sovereignty, issues tied to a desire for a stronger border control, for cultural 
integrity. These concerns are not inherently xenophobic. They become problematic when they are framed in exclusion, in the language of exclusion or the language of discrimination. But this current political flux has left many feeling politically, morally, ethically homeless. Traditional parties struggling to maintain broad coalitions as issues like Brexit cut across the conventional left-right divide. This has led to new political movements to parties that aim to capture the disaffected. Parties like Reform UK, the emergence of Nigel Farage's Brexit party, UKIP, the renewed prominence of the Lib Dems during the Brexit negotiations. All of this illustrates this phenomenon. And a key issue here is that voters feel that neither the Conservative Party nor the Labour Party fully represent their views. The Conservatives' focus on Brexit and national sovereignty has alienated their more moderate supporters, while Labour's shift towards a more progressive agenda under Keir Starmer has left some centrists feeling abandoned. And the centre of British politics, this highly fluid, this contested space, that's not, it seems, where the debate is taking place. The debate is taking place in the, in, in, in the corners. The traditional markers of left and right are being redefined partly due to the seismic impact of Brexit. As parties and ideologies shift, many people feel increasingly disconnected from the political system. And this sense of disenfranchisement reflects a broader crisis of political identity where boundaries of the centre and the extremes are in eternal flux. As we navigate this period of uncertainty, we need to engage in more respectful dialogue with everybody. Um, simply because somebody says, oh, they're, in the, they're, they're on the left or they're on the right, doesn't mean we shouldn't be talking to them. We should. Because we need to find out what is our new identity? Who are we now, post-Brexit? How has Brexit redefined you and me? Not just our, our, our national isolation. How has Brexit changed us? Um, and only with this engagement with people across the political spectrum can we find a new centre. Can we articulate what that centre is? Because listening to these people on talk TV, for example, you're listening to two people who agree with everything the other says. It's like listening to two flamingos chattering in a pond. It, it makes no sense at all. It's not even terribly good television. Um, you know, only through engagement with people who don't quite share our views can we get a new centre can, can we actually get exciting and interesting television but uh, GB News is fascinating for slapping people down uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg gets people on and then slaps them down just when they're getting interesting dreadful really entertaining but dreadful that's not the way to energise the debate that's the way to claim control of the little mountain. I'm the king of the castle. But this isn't about a castle. This is about a country. And how do we find where we are in that country? How do we find the values and the aspirations in this diverse and dynamic society that has emerged post-Brexit? 